Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Many thanks for joining this third webinar on uh, water innovation in the field of Earth observation. My name is Gareth James Lloyd, and I'm a senior advisor at the UNEP DHI Partnership uh, United Nations Environmental Collaboration Center in the area of uh, freshwater and environment. Uh, I'm going to be the facilitator of this webinar today with technical support from my colleague Cheng Zi, who's kindly agreed to cover for Maya on this occasion. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about who we are and what we do, please check out our uh, website after we're done here. Uh, this webinar series is organized by DHI, UNEP DHI, in uh, collaboration with the Academy by DHI, as well as uh, other valued partners, such as the European Space Agency and DHI GRASS, who we're very pleased to have with us today. And as some of you know, the aim of this series is to give some kind of insight into the role that innovative uh, approaches can play in supporting the water-related sustainable uh, development goals, or SDGs. Uh, in this third webinar, the focus is going to be on supporting uh, SDG 6 on water and sanitation uh, with Earth observation. And as we're going to hear, the current situation is that the goals and most, if not all, of the headline indicators have been agreed upon. However, the, the methodologies for these indicators are still to be regarded as some kind of work in progress. In terms of the monitoring, the reality is that uh, many countries are, are going to have different needs, as well as varying strengths and weaknesses, all of which are going to change over time. And at the same time, technical, uh, technological capabilities are going to be increasing, not least in the field of Earth observation. And such technologies offer potentially game-changing, uh, not to exaggerate, uh, opportunities for improved monitoring in terms of supplementing or even uh, potentially replacing more traditional methods of, of monitoring. Um, the stage we're at now is that a dialogue is underway between various key stakeholders, uh, organizations and governments about what can be done and how. And what we're going to do here today is to share with you some of the potential possibilities for Earth Observation or EO to support the SDG work. And on the agenda today, we have uh, Peter Kofu Björnsson of UNIT DHI Partnership, and uh, Peter is going to be talking about the water, uh, water targets and indicators of the SDGs. We have uh, Benjamin Kurtz of the European Space Agency, who is going to be talking about Earth observation for sustainable development, uh, the case for water and SDG 6. And then we have uh, Christian Tutrop of DHI Grass, who's going to be talking about supporting SDG monitoring with Earth observation. And um, we're going to follow these presentations, the three presentations, with some questions from you, the audience. And uh, as usual, we're going to round off with some information on the uh, up and coming webinars. Uh, the plan is that each presentation is going to take about approximately 10 minutes. As usual, I'm going to be a little bit strict on timekeeping to make sure that we're, ever, uh, we're able to cover everything. So, sorry in advance to you, the presenters. Um, the, the plan is to allow for one to two questions immediately after each presentation with time to, to take those additional questions that you may or may not have uh, at the end. Um, and if you look in the panel on the right of your screen, you should be able to see a box for submitting questions um, on the uh, on the right hand side there. If you unfold it, you can type and write uh, questions to us there. So please uh, make sure to uh, to use that um, whenever you uh, whenever you think of something you need to know that we're not covering. I also need to remember to tell you that of. Uh, all these water webinars in the series are being recorded and made publicly available on YouTube and also via our website at unipdhi.org. So, as mentioned, Peters will be the first of our three presentations today, but unfortunately, he's being called away with work. But the good news is we've managed to make a video recording 
of him saying what he needs to say beforehand. And uh, I'm going to play that for you um, very shortly. Uh, just for the record, we much prefer, of course, to run with live presentations, but that simply wasn't possible on this occasion, so please accept my sincere apologies for that. But thankfully, Benjamin and uh, Christian are here, and the three of us will do our best to respond to any questions you may have to, uh, to the content of what uh, Peter is presenting. So let's jump right into the most exciting bit, the content, with Peter's presentation. We're going to use this part to give you an update on the latest status of the goals and indicators, as well as the process timeline for the first baseline and synthesis reports. Uh, this first presentation will also help to set the scene for what's to follow. So please just bear with me a few seconds while I get things up and uh, running. Good afternoon, my name is Peter Bjørnsen. I work for the United Nations Environment Program uh, as the head of a center on water environment located in Denmark. And uh, I would like to start this webinar this afternoon by presenting the water targets and the indicators that have been decreed, agreed for, for the uh, water SDG as part of the 2030 agenda. The um, dedicated goal on water, which is the Sustainable Development Goal number six, uh, really tries to address a number of, of risks and challenges uh, across the uh, hydrological cycle uh, and put water and sanitation at the core of sustainable development uh, with, with links to many of the other sustainable development goals. And under this dedicated goal for water, there is uh, a number of uh, sub-goals or targets. Uh, the two first targets are a continuation of the Millennium Development Goal targets on access to drinking water and sanitation. And then there are four new targets that address uh, water quality and wastewater, the use of water as a resource, uh, addressing water scarcity, the integrated management of water resources, and the water-related ecosystems and two additional targets that are more addressing the uh, so-called means of implementation, how to achieve the, the other targets. Then related to that, there is a, a target which has been placed in another goal, goal 11 and target 11.5, which address uh, water-related disasters. And of course, there are linkages to many of the other goals, like the goal on food, the one on on health and uh, production and ecosystems and climate and so on. But we'll focus here on goal six and the targets under that. And I'll present very briefly the, the targets and the agreed core indicators for tracking the progress on, on these targets. So the first uh, target is on drinking water to achieve uh, access to safe and affordable drinking water for, for all. And the agreed core indicator for that is simply the proportion of the population that is using safely managed drinking water services. And similar for the second goal on sanitation and hygiene, the target is to achieve access for all uh, to safe uh, sanitation. Um, and uh, the uh, indicator for that is similarly to the first one, the proportion of the population using safely managed sanitation services. Um, so those two indicators follow very closely the tracking of the uh, Millennium Development Goal targets on water and sanitation that have been measured uh, annually for, for decades. Uh, for the new targets under the water goal, uh, we have to define and uh, put in place uh, new indicators. So for target 6.3, which is on water quality and wastewater to improve water quality by reducing pollution and um, reduce the release of, of uh, hazardous material, uh, half the proportion of untreated wastewater and increase recycling and safe reuse. So that's kind of a very composite target and uh, it needs more than one indicator to track that. So there's been two indicators agreed to. One is the proportion of wastewater that is safely treated. So that links a little bit to the to the two previous targets. And the second one is looking at the ambient water quality. Uh, 
Um, now these uh, these indicators are new, so the uh, wastewater indicator will be tracked partly by looking at the uh, waste for water from households, but also to look at the wastewater from industries, which is a very complex uh, mix of, of various sources of wastewater. So that's um, that's going to to be a challenge to build that up and similarly with the ambient water quality there there are some measurements in in some countries but uh, this is now trying to establish a, a comprehensive and coherent monitoring of ambient water quality in the beginning focus on focusing on five specific parameters which are uh, oxygen and uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and uh, salinization and uh, and E. coli as a measure of the um, of the fecal pollution. For target six four uh, on water use use and scarcity, it talks about increasing the water use efficiency across all sectors and ensure that the withdrawals are within sustainable limits. So again, that is a composite target that would need several indicators. Uh, so far two indicators have been agreed to. One is the change in water use efficiency over time, looking at the uh, various uh, sectors that use water, so it's agricultural water use efficiency, industrial use efficiency and municipal use efficiency. And the second indicator is uh, on the level of water stress. Uh, meaning the amount of fresh water that is withdrawn as a proportion of the available fresh water resources to as an indicator of, of uh, water stress. And uh, recently there's been a request for a third indicator for, for this target looking at the uh, number of people affected by water scarcity. 6.5 is on integrated water resource management to implement integrated water resource management at all levels including through transboundary cooperation and uh, there is uh, an, a core indicator that looks at the degree of integrated water resource management which would be uh, based on a questionnaire to countries asking them how far they are in terms of the policies and plans and in terms of the institutional building the uh, uh, application of management instruments and the finance for IWM and putting all that into a, an overall index. And then there is an additional indicator focusing in on the transboundary cooperation and looking at the area in a country, uh, in a country's uh, transboundary area that is under uh, arrangement for, for international cooperation. And finally, the uh, target 6.6 six on water-related ecosystems, which is really looking at protecting and restoring water-related ecosystems because of the water-related ecosystem services that they provide, focusing on, on a wide number of ecosystem types. Um, for that indicator, uh, the, for that target, there is a proposed indicator to look at the change in extent of water-related ecosystems over time. So that would focus on uh, wetlands and lakes and rivers and aquifers and look at the physical uh, extent of those uh, water-related ecosystems, but also over time the uh, state of the, of the ecosystems. So altogether, it's uh, right now uh, a list of uh, 11 indicators with probably one more being added uh, for target 6.4. And for each of these indicators, uh, um, a UN agency has been nominated as the custodian agency for that indicator, meaning that they would support the global rollout and support countries in reporting on these specific indicators. And uh, as I mentioned, for, for the two first indicators, uh, arrangements are already in place, whereas for the other indicators, it's still work in progress. And this is all uh, supported by a project that's co coordinated by the, by the UN Water, which is the coordinating mechanism for water in the UN system. Uh, so uh, draft methodologies have been developed for these various core indicators and they are now being pilot tested in five to seven countries and based on the experience we learned from, from that pilot testing we will revise the methodologies and then be ready for a global rollout next year which would then uh, 
provide the baseline data for a, for a first census report on STD6 to be uh, produced by 2018 so that the high-level political forum under the UN General Assembly can review the water target the first time in 2018. So it's a very ambitious uh, timeline and uh, there's, uh, there's a lot to do still. It's, um, it's very important that all this uh, sustainable development goal monitoring builds on uh, national data. It's, it's owned by, by the countries and it should build on national data. Uh, but we also have to realize that these uh, national data sources are uh, far from complete and uh, there are still issues in many countries on collecting this data and processing it and sharing it. So there, is, uh, there will be a need to supplement that national data with regional and, and global data, uh, for example, from, from Earth observation. And, and also we have to be pragmatic in, uh, in um, having a stepwise approach to, to this monitoring so that we, we, we can start, uh, or some countries can start on, on, a, on a less ambitious level and then build up their monitoring uh, over the 15 years to, to come. So uh, with that, I, I hope that uh, I've given a a little bit of a briefing that can that can be an introduction to the to the following um, presentations on Earth observation contributions to the to the uh, monitoring of SDGs. Thanks. Well, many thanks to Peter for that. Uh, I can see, as, as he was talking, I was going through uh, looking for the questions, and as yet, we haven't received any whatsoever. So we're either doing very well or very badly, and you can let us know, either by submitting your questions or by uh, letting us know in a little bit more detail what you think uh, in the survey that we're going to send you at the, at the end of this um, webinar. But without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to uh, Benjamin, who's our uh, second presenter. Benjamin, if you could unmute your mic and get your presentation ready. That looks great from here. Please proceed whenever you're ready. Thanks a lot, uh, and thanks a lot for um, organizing and introducing you to this webinar. Um, I work at the European Space Agency, who's uh, designing, building, and launching satellites to observe the Earth, but also trying to make sure that these type of data collected from space is being used in, the di in different types of user and scientific communities. And here we focus on how that can be used in the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, specifically in the in Goal 6, the water case. So just uh, to give a short introduction um, where we think uh, the role of Earth observation can play a, a role um, in the SDG 6. Um, obviously, as we heard, in the many, many uh, indicators and many of these information cannot be observed by Earth observation. Um, 11 of these indicators uh, for the SD6 is, um, is certainly most of them rely on in situ data provided by the national um, authorities. But uh, we have identified uh, from our side uh, and also discussing the community that there is about uh, four indicators where we can make contribution complementing what is happening on the ground, uh, making and the picture more complete and give a consistent monitoring um, device from Earth observation over time and space. So I would just want to re uh, um, repeat these indicators. Uh, we believe that will be one uh, related to the 6.11, where if you see the using of uh, water uh, safely water services is relying actually on the access to water and there we can at least uh, uh, monitor what is available in terms of fresh water, meaning uh, the, the fresh water, open fresh water, water bodies mapping. 
um, or in, or even giving some kind of indirect um, assessment of the changes in the groundwater. And the second um, indicator um, that is related actually to the first is the proportion of water bodies with good amb ambient water quality. We do have um, um, earth observation measurements which can relate to the water quality as an indicator, a proxy if you want so. Um, that is, can be easily be mapped on national level. We also can understand how many water bodies are actually there, so you get the proportion of it. So that's already two different types of contribution there. And the water use efficiency, um, we are looking at the water, uh, water evapotranspiration from mainly from the, the crop um, agriculture production. So we can manage, measure the the evapotranspiration on one side, how much water is being used from the crop, and on the other side, how much uh, the crop is actually producing in yield, and with that you go up to the water use efficiency. And the final one is the most obvious one, there is the extent of water-related ecosystems. We do can manage, uh, measure the extent of forest, wetlands, water bodies over time very consistently and at global scale. That introduction would to go to the Earth observation in detail. Here you see a video from the pair of Sentinel trues, which will be soon both in orbit. One is already there. Um, you see how it uh, observes continuously the Earth or the whole globe and the land um, part of it. Um, every five days you will have an observation at every single point on the Earth from Sentinel two in 10 meters. Um, I will go into detail further on, but I want to stress here this type of information is continuous over space and time and being from, um, taken from space, being independent um, from, uh, from, the, from the measurements uh, um, on the ground. So this, that was one example, Sentinel-2, but uh, that is part of the whole fleet uh, of uh, satellites. Uh, um, being uh, built, launched by, by ESA, but owned and funded by the European Union. It's a huge uh, public investment from the European uh, citizens. And it's in, in the scale of billions of euros, which will be invested over the next 20 years. And the that will allow us to have a long-term continuity over the next 20 years, having redundant information from different satellites, and most importantly, all that information will be free and open um, to everybody, and, and the data is already by now on the, on the available on the internet. And petabytes of data have been already downloaded from Sentinel One, Sentinel Two. Both of them are already up in space and providing information from Sentinel One, for example, for floods and uh, water bodies, but also Sentinel Two for agriculture and water quality. And most recently, we launched Sentinel Three, which is giving a more uh, global um, 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 perspective in terms of uh, lower resolution but higher frequencies. And all of that is being built to be an operational system and not a scientific um, system anymore. So more in detail, Sentinel-1 is a C-band synthetic aperture radar. Um, that is uh, an active system, so it, uh, it it emits uh, information and uh, radiation from um, in, the, in the microwave penetrating the cloud, so it's weather independent. Um, both of them, both we have two satellites already up in space, uh, launched in 2014 and most recently in April 2016. They provide uh, up to uh, um, weekly six-day um, um, coverage um, every six day. Uh, in, coverage um, in, in good parts of the world. Um, that is something which can be used, as I said, for floods, water bodies, but also for soil moisture, as I can show you here. Um, that the information is here in that um, context relevant for the SDG 6.1, as I said, the water bodies, and 6.6, for example, the, the extent of wetlands which you see on the right-hand side, blue, the permanent water bodies, and the wetland uh, in green. That could be updated in the monthly level or annual um, uh, frequency, that depending how the, the frequency of the SDG monitoring will be requested. 
On the optical side, we have Sentinel-2. That is the continuity of the Landsat uh, mission from uh, the Americans. Um, it, with that, you also have historic continuity. You go back into the 70s. Um, but uh, here we have added is beyond the 30 meter Landsat resolution, 10 and 20 meters on a very large score, which allows us with two missions to have a five-day repeat cycle, which is tripling, basically, the revisit. Re and with that, you really have um, information on the dynamics of um, vegetation, agriculture, but also on water quality. And here you see uh, a maximum chlorophyll index, which is uh, rele relevant for phytoplankton in the lake over Lake Turkana. And you see the changes in the north of the lake due to nitrogen um, um, coming in from the Omo River, um, bringing in pollution in terms of nutrition. And you can see that in the images, and you can monitor this continuously over time and space. This is a cooperation, actually, with the UNEP uh, James Water, and we're trying to build that into the national point of context, uh, focal points uh, of relevant, responsible for the SDGs. Finally, there's Sentinel-3, uh, the first uh, mission launched uh, uh, very recently um, from uh, in February this year. It's still uh, being basically uh, calibrated and being set up for operations. Here you get uh, lower resolution, but for that daily information, so you really get a high frequency for uh, dynamics, for example, in water um, being very highly dynamic and changing on the optical side, um, but also in the thermal information, which uh, you will see is very important um, for um, the SDG 6.4 target, where we, we look into the evapotranspiration and the lens surface temperature is a driver for that, uh, which is absolutely needed to actually um, observe and monitor the changes in evapotranspiration. So this, all this information coming from, from space is absolutely, well, from my perspective, obviously, uh, uh, very inspiring and very uh, changing in terms of um, available data and scale and resolution. But all that is only useful if you combine that into and integrate it into existing know-how and uh, systems. So starting from data, you have uh, Earth observation and in situ data. That is something which is the, the basis to have information in, in informing decisions. But you also need to use this data. So there you have research and development and training being necessary to make that link possible. But also you need the technical capacity. And I'm talking here about infrastructure in terms of processing, but you also need the right algorithms, tools which are operational, delivering this information into the right um, system. And finally, this information needs to be brought into the decision-making process, and that's probably one of the most difficult ones to really um, have an understanding what the information is and how that is actually linking into the, the real questions from decision ma ma managers. As I have here examples like the Lake Shot Basin Commission or Zamcom, and they are, they are the mandated um, authorities to, to do this kind of decision and monitoring. That I would like to close making uh, again the point about the benefits of satellite Earth observation. There is the consistency of these informations, which is really over space and time possible. It's, it's not depending on the single person in some place. Uh, it's, it's much more objective in that sense. You have um, um, the, also the possibility to look beyond borders. So water is really flowing across borders. Uh, so observation, which is being available or given by satellites, have, can be given by national, but also in basin scale, and potentially being transferred then also to the global scale. Finally, being independent, uh, you have a transparency in, in this uh, observation, and that will allow you for independent reporting. Again, for the SDGs, very important to understand. And the, the information on the ground being compared also to other organizations. 
And since we have a history of all this information, you can also study long-term trends. And that is in the climate change context, obviously, very important. And you draw it as one of the keywords in this context, for example, in the water domain. Sustainability is another point, uh, open and free data coming from operational emissions. That is what the Sentinels are being providing in the moment. And that is new, actually, in the Earth observation side, uh, that we have this open and free data on a long-term and reliable information for, for everybody. All this technology would not work if you don't work in partnership. And here we do already work with UNEP, and uh, UNEP DHI is one of our partners, but also the GEMS, the UN Ramsar. We, we also work with the UNDP CapNet, FAO, and uh, the development banks to make sure that this kind of technology is available on the national and global level to use for monitoring of water resources in national to global scale. That I would like to conclude, and thank you very much for your attention. And many thanks from uh, my side as well, Benjamin. Please don't run away quite yet, because uh, I have, uh, I have a, one or two questions for you. Uh, some questions arrived on the first presentation. I'm going to take the most straightforward ones of, uh, of those uh, and a general question. Um, a few people have asked about the slides being made available after the webinar. Yes, we're, we're going to do that. Um, we've had someone um, ask uh, regarding uh, the SDG indicators discussed and whether the, the information provided at, uh, against these indicators at national levels can be uh, used to infer glo global trends in water. And uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, that is the ambition, certainly at the national level, that you can take the various data for each of the, uh, the individual uh, targets uh, from the indicators underneath and begin to kind of uh, bring that together in some kind of coherent uh, uh, story and uh, give uh, some some meaningful trends that uh, can then be acted upon or used as inspiration. Uh, we've also had uh, someone ask why um, Earth observation can't, uh, can't be used for IWRM. Um, I think uh, I think it can um, for some uh, aspects, and I'm pleased to say that we're going to be picking up on that in, uh, I think Christian will say a few words about that in the next presentation. Um, but a quick question for you, um, Benjamin, is, uh, let me find it here. Um, how relevant is Earth observation in monitoring things like economic scarcity of water? And just to uh, just before you just while you gather your thoughts, economic scarcity of water is caused by typically a lack of investment in infrastructure, water-related infrastructure, or or insufficient uh, human capacity to satisfy demand. And this is uh, typically in a a specific area where the population can't afford to use or to access the resource. Can uh, Benjamin, can Earth observations uh, make a contribution in this area or, or not? Well, in general, Earth observation is related to physical um, features on the Earth, so economic uh, in in as a, as a process, a human process, we, we do not observe, but we observe the activity, the economical activities on the earth. Um, in that sense, water um, scarcity being uh, caused by, for example, mining, agriculture activities, which is, could be also commercial, um, we do have this kind of uh, monitoring uh, happening, and you can on one hand side map these activities and estimate their their water use and you can combine and compare that to the availability of fresh water and, and also observed by earth observation so in that terms we can contribute to this type of um, um, question um, but certainly not solve it as a standalone uh, measurement Okay, and just very quickly, uh, I'll, I'll save that question for later. I can see time is running. Uh, I'm going to pass, uh, 
many thanks for that, Benjamin. I'm going to pass the presentation over to uh, Christian, uh, but please hang around. We're going to come back to you. Christian, please could you unmute your uh, microphone and uh, start your presentation. I'll let you know when it looks good. That, that looks great. Please proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you, Garrett, and uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Christian Tottrup. I'm a senior project manager in uh, DSI Grass, and in that role, I'm currently involved in a number of projects that uh, applies Earth observation methods and tools to address water challenges globally. I will try and build on Benjamin's presentation, providing some more examples on how Earth observation can support SDG monitoring and here under also recognizing the need to transfer the technology to the countries who are in fact uh, responsible for the monitoring. Just to set the scene, then uh, with the SDGs, there's now a need to extract information on water-related issues over large spatial scales and time periods in order to support the monitoring requirements. Today, there's growing awareness that Earth observation data has the potential to provide robust uh, monitoring of several uh, SDG indicators because of the consistency, accessibility, repeatability, and global coverage of Earth observation data. And as we just heard also now with increasing capacities in terms of uh, spatial detail and revisit times. A recent publication by the World Bank has highlighted the many applications of Earth's observation for water resource management. Uh, the book shows, amongst others, that all major components of the hydrological cycle, uh, perhaps with the exception of river discharge, can now be estimated using Earth's observation, including precipitation, evapotranspiration, and soil moisture, as well as vegetation cover and surface water extent. Other examples include water quality and levels, snow cover, and water storage dynamics. With this range of water information products, there should be a potential for Earth observation to support the monitoring requirements under SDG 6 uh, on clean water and sanitation. Over the next slides, I will try and provide some examples of SDG targets where Earth observation can support the progress monitoring, uh, monitoring of associated indicators, uh, either directly, here highlighted by the green frames, or indirectly, uh, as indicated by the, by the yellow frame. I'm not going to claim that this will be a complete list, and especially for indirect or partly support, I'm sure there will be many other examples on how uh, Earth observation can su uh, support the progress uh, monitoring of uh, SDG 6. Let's start with target 6.3 on water quality and wastewater issues. The indicator of most relevance here is 6.32, uh, uh, which is defined as a proportion of all water bodies in the country having good uh, ambient water quality. It will support countries in accessing the outcome, uh, outcomes of measures taken to improve water quality. And monitoring of this indicator can at least partly be uh, supported by Earth observation. Previously, Earth observation-based uh, water quality mapping was restricted to coastal waters and large uh, lakes, as seen in this chlorophyll map from, uh, from Lake Victoria. But as we just uh, heard in the previous presentation, the new enhanced capacities of Sentinel-2 now provi provides an opportunity to, uh, to monitor smaller inland water bodies and river systems. Some of the water quality parameters which have been successfully derived with uh, Earth's observation includes chlorophyll, turbidity, seki depth, and water surface temperature. The high-resolution mapping of these parameters is still a field under development, but it does bear some important perspectives for simple and cost-effective approach for providing national-scale data uh, for a restricted number of, uh, of these water quality parameters. It is also worth mentioning that Earth observation can support indicator 6.32 by providing an accurate delineation of water bodies uh, in countries where such detailed inventories does not exist. There are already some medium resolution uh, maps available uh, on, water, on, on water bodies, for example, from the uh, Global Change Initiative by ESA. 
But uh, again, the higher resolution national maps can def definitely be produced using a combination of, of the Sentinel data and perhaps also uh, Landsat data. Finally, I think it's worth also mentioning that uh, this indicator on water, uh, water quality and its methodology is uh, directly connected to indicator 631 on wastewater treatment, where uh, which could also be supported by Earth observation in terms of uh, locating uh, point source facilities and monitoring uh, the associated uh, uh, discharge uh, pollutant. If we move on to target 6.4, then it concerns water use and scarcity, and the associated indicator uh, 6.41 on change in water use efficiency can also to a certain extent be, uh, be supported by Earth's observation. The monitoring support is only partial since this indicator covers water use efficiency in uh, three major sectors, uh, irrigated agriculture, industry and services, and it's only really the irrigated ag agriculture which uh, lent itself for, for Earth's observation. To estimate water use efficiency in irrigation, one needs information on, uh, on the extent and productivity of crops as well as the crop water consumption uh, through evapotranspiration mapping. Uh, and again, it's all parameters which can uh, be, uh, be estimated using uh, Earth's observation. But as I said, irrigation is only representing one part of the computation for indicator 6.41, so it's my understanding that in this case, Earth's observation is uh, considered as an emerging opportunity, and, uh, and the full computation, computation of the indicator will, will require inputs from, from other data sources. In contrast, the next indicator on water, uh, related ecosystems, uh, especially indicator 6.61 on change in the extent of water-related uh, ecosystems over time is one that, uh, that lends itself very well to Earth's observation uh, monitoring. Although the indicator encompasses all water-related ecosystems, uh, I would just look at the wetland extent here, but uh, acknowledging that water body mapping has already been mentioned and that monitoring of other water-related uh, ecosystems such as forest and drylands is actually considered under, under uh, SDG 15, Life on Land, where we have indicator 5.11 on forest area as a proportion of total land area, and 15.31 uh, on uh, proportion of land that is de degraded over total land area. Both indicator which is uh, definitely also uh, suitable to Earth's observation and uh, monitoring. But going back to wetland extent, then uh, it can be mapped globally by looking at the vegetation cover, soil moisture content, and inundation uh, frequency. Using a hybrid sensor approach that's uh, combining optical and radar observation, observations uh, will provide a more robust uh, wetland delineation where optical imagery uh, being more sensitive to the vegetation cover and radar imagery to the soil moisture content. In addition, the higher frequency of observations stemming from uh, the combined usage of optical and radar acquisitions will contribute to a better characterization of seasonal dynamics, which is important uh, so that seasonal and temporary changes do not lead to forced conclusions uh, of the overall trend, uh, trend in, uh, in wetland extent. The examples you see here is from a hybrid Sentinel-1-2 mapping uh, of the mangroves along the Senegal-Gambia coast and uh, with the upper feature showing uh, the overall trend of restored marshland vegetation in the southern Iraq as uh, observed by Moody's uh, imagery. I would also like to mention target 6.5 on, uh, on water resource management, uh, which includes an indicator on the degree of uh, IWRM implementation. And while uh, Earth observation does not increase the degree of IWRM uh, in itself, then uh, integrated water resource management do need to be supported by access to reliable water information, which in many cases can be provided by Earth observation. 
One tool which can uh, support the data needs for IWRM is the water observation and information system uh, developed in the context of the, the TigerNet project. The aim of this project was to develop and demonstrate an open source system for monitoring, assessing and inventorying water resources in a cost-effective manner by uh, satellite observations. Today the voice system provides the operational capacity to produce a number of uh, Earth observation based uh, information products uh, in harmonized and transparent uh, 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 coverage which is needed uh, for IWRM and it also comes with some building capacities uh, that could provide support for the SDG monitoring. The system has been developed in collaboration with selected African water authorities and it has been designed in direct response to their requirements in terms of current technological and human capacity as well as the application specific monitoring uh, demands. As such, the system goes some way in demonstrating a credible and cost effective tool for water resource monitoring in, uh, in uh, resource constrained uh, countries. This is an important point uh, for in fact supporting SDG monitoring with Earth observation is not only about what can be done but also who can and will do the monitoring. As the countries own the SDG monitoring and reporting there's a need to look at how we can enable national Earth observation based monitoring. This is especially relevant for the least developed countries where reliable information may be sparse and where challenges in human and institutional capacity may be a serious constraint for, for effective monitoring. In other words, we need to recognize the critical importance of supporting the capacity of national statistical offices uh, to ensure access to high quality, timely and reliable data. And in doing so, uh, we need to consider flexible methods so countries can enter the monitoring process in line with national capacity and, uh, and resource availability. Over time, the monitoring may then advance as the capacity and the resources uh, increases. This enabling capacity is, is uh, something that is being recognized by the Club Within Africa, which is a three-year project launched by the European Space Agency in partnership uh, with the Ramsar Convention on, on, uh, on Wetlands. The project started in 2015 and has as a principal objective uh, to develop an open source software toolbox uh, for the end-to-end -end processing of a number of Earth observation products needed to better assess the conditions of wetlands and monitor their trends over time. This project has a clear focus on capacity building to increase the local capacity for Earth observation based wetland monitoring and to allow for full transfer of the methods, tools uh, and products to the partner organization. In addition, the project strives to contribute to the Geo Wetlands Initiative and the development of a global wetland observing system which is in line with the SDG monitoring requirements. Uh, in fact, as, uh, and as can be seen in the lower uh, figure, then for most of the global and Africa information products, there is uh, a clear link with the previously discussed uh, SDG targets. One minute please, Christian. Yes, I'm almost there. I'd just like to, to also uh, note the mentioning of this progressive monitoring that is the stepwise increase in, in the monitoring coverage to add value to an initial uh, assessment. In this case, you can say the wetland inventory could represent an initial step needed to monitor change in spatial extent of wetlands over large areas. This initial inventory can then be advanced by more detailed habitat mapping uh, to measure ecosystem status and health at the level of uh, individual wetland sites uh, regarded as being, specific, uh, being of specific importance. So let me round off and conclude that uh, Earth observation can be used as a cost-effective monitoring tool for many indicators needed to track the progress of targets under SDG 6. I've also tried to make the point that Earth observation is especially useful in developing countries where reliable water information is often scarce and or uh, unreliable. Uh, finally, and to ensure the sustainability and adaptation of Earth observation at the national level, there is a need to develop and build capacity to apply best practice methods and tools which can be operated and maintained within the institutional, technical and financial means of, uh, of the individual countries. And with that, I will say uh, thank you and uh, hand it back to you, Garrett.
many thanks for that question. Um, actually, in relation, uh, you brought up cost in your uh, last slide there. Um, we have many good questions. One I have here is, let me see, here we go. Isn't it a danger that governments will cut budgets for national systems of monitoring for different indicators with the hope or by using the argument that everything could eventually or many things could be eventually be monitored by Earth observation? Do you want to say a few words about that? I can try, I would say. I mean, of course, here we placing a very strong emphasis of what can be done with Earth observation, you could also have circumvented and, 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 and focus more on the limitations. So I think uh, we should also be very clear as a community what we can and what we cannot do. Um, and I think Benjamin already mentioned that in the, the beginning of his um, presentation that it was all, that for the most part of the uh, indicators in situ data is, is really required. Uh, so right. we only want to contribute where we can make a difference and where we think we have uh, the right technology. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a second question for you is um, how can EO data be used to validate or compare data of individual countries? Well, you also always have this uh, uh, can say hierarchy of of, uh, of satellite data available from very fine resolution to coarser resolution data, and there's certainly a scope to have some inter validation between high and coarse resolution data. Um, what we will try to promote in terms of not having too uh, too many different approaches at the national level is to promote some kind of harmonized approach which will work uh, across countries uh, to to get harmonized data. Uh, right. I'm not sure if that's this addressing the, the question. I think it's about as far as we're going to get right now. But uh, uh, Benjamin, if I could ask you to reopen your microphone, please. Um, could you please say a couple of words quite quickly, uh, or as succinctly as possible, on what you regard would be, or what you regard is the long-term availability of EO data? Well, um, I mean, for us, I think that is a very, working with the different user communities, that is one of the main request to make it actually useful in the operational way and actually also that regards to any monitoring in an environment um, and for that it actually built the sentinels uh, in, the, in, in the regard of uh, having operational systems around so there is a 20 year or, um, a guarantee for that but there's also, if you look at um, the different um, activities of different space agency, but also the private sector in the recent years, uh, a large range of um, um, capabilities coming from the from space, um, which will be available for for applications and operations. Um, there are companies who promise that. Um, that is good in terms of redundancy and uh, also giving a, a choice of, of different uh, measurements. The thing is more there um, in terms of long-term availability that you also have to consider the, the um, robustness and the, um, let's say, comparability between all these different data sources. But uh, what I want to say in, in one sentence is there is a lot of data and we as space agencies try to support this type of long-term um, measurement uh, and giving it to the user communities over time spans which are much longer than the research um, type of missions which have been around until recently. Thanks for that, Benjamin. And Christian, I have a last question for you. Uh, that is, can the presented techniques be applied anywhere in the globe or are there limitations? Can you unmute your mic, please, Christian? Uh, in principle, yes, they can uh, be applied globally, but uh, I would also highly recommend when that uh, you look at uh, at uh, local adaptations when you are you are zooming in. 
but the data is there, as Benjamin showed, on a global level, and, and the methods is also more or less uh, applicable with some uh, mod uh, opportunities for, for, uh, for local regional adapt uh, adaptations. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, thanks for the last word on that, Christian. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for regarding the questions right now. There were a lot of other very good ones as well, so my, please accept my apologies if we never got to those. Some of them we're going to be uh, trying to respond to as a follow-up. Um, as mentioned, this uh, this is or was the third of the six webinars we currently have planned, and uh, the moment we have a space in October penciled out, uh, penciled in as, uh, as a tentative date for the next one on uh, new tools uh, and methods for flood and drought management. Uh, further information on those dates, times and details, we're going to be making those available on our website and via the relevant mailing lists, etc. once we've got the final confirmation and details in place. Please allow me to uh, begin by concluding today's session by thanking the presenters for taking the time to show you, share their knowledge with all of us. And uh, I'd, of course, also like to thank you, the participants, for, for taking the time to join in. And uh, if you have any burning issues, please send an email to Cheng Z, and uh, he will do he will do his best to uh, to get back to you soonest or connect you with the right person. As mentioned earlier, we're always looking for ways to improve the quality of our work uh, or for new ideas for webinars, so we'd be very grateful if you could uh, use a couple of minutes to just quickly respond to that feedback survey that you're going to be receiving very shortly. And uh, last and not least, of course, please allow me to wish you all a very good morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are. <laughs>